Welcome to the No Sports Report, a production of iHeartRadio and Treefort Media. My name is Jensen Karp, and I'm a sports fan. And right when we thought we were facing the largest world problem with COVID-19, like Mothra joining forces with Godzilla, our country is facing a new wave of mainstream attention on the epidemic of systematic racism, and it shook us to the core. Even if sports does return in July, will the civil rights issues that we know are front and center on the minds of our most influential athletes keep them off courts and fields in hope of political change and justice? It's all very heavy, and this week we've produced the podcast a little differently. I continue to talk to athletes and sports industry professionals about how they're feeling during this unprecedented time while sports is still not in our lives. This is the No Sports Report. Michael Bennett has always admitted he's a complex guy. On the field, he takes no prisoners, he's aggressive, and a Super Bowl champion. At one point, on the Seattle Seahawks, he was a league favorite because of his pelvis-thrusting celebration dance that he once described as two angels dancing while chocolate is coming from the heavens on a nice Sunday morning. The only thing better than Michael Bennett's God-given skills is his personality. But alongside that outspoken humor was a desire to make change. Bennett has proven that although on Sundays he could be ruthless, outside of work, the soft-spoken defensive end might care too much. He spent years supporting Black Lives Matter, created his own foundation focused on improving the health and well-being of children, called himself a feminist in the toxic masculinity of the NFL, and in front of millions of fans, peacefully protested the national anthem in the name of police brutality and racial inequality by kneeling, sitting, or staying in the locker room. As a well-covered victim of racial profiling himself, I wanted to speak to the now NFL free agent about what he's seen this week, what it's like to fear for your life while being held down by police, and if things might actually change this time. This is my conversation with football player Michael Bennett on the No Sports Report. Call from... Humanitarian and also author of Think to Make White People Uncomfortable. To accept, press 1. Hello, Michael. Yeah, what's up? How you doing? Let's start off by asking where you're quarantining. How have you been handling it? Your your wife, your three daughters, you guys all in the same house? Yeah, we're in the same house. Still in Hawaii. I mean, I think we've been handling it pretty well. I think it is this uh, when you are a busy person and you used to running around and finally you get to slow down, you start to really feel like what's the most important and essential things in life. And I think you realize that in this quarantine, these are the most essential things. And it's your family, your kids. And you realize the amount of time that you get to spend with them is very short. Mm. And then once you start just being together, you realize, like, oh, I didn't really know that. And then you start to get reintroducing yourself. I think sometimes with relationships, we forget to water them so they don't grow as much as we want them to do. And being forced to be at home a lot every day, you are forced to, you know, guard your plants and guard your relationships with your family. Mm-hmm. And I've talked to a couple athletes who are from Hawaii, and I've asked them the question if being inside in Hawaii is more torturous than, you know, like being in Los Angeles or something. It's like you're looking at the water, you're looking at these beautiful things, and you can't go partake in it. Is that Does that just crush you at all? No, it doesn't crush me at all. I think it's just a part of it. I think it's the safety of the whole is more important than the one moment of being in the ocean or being in the grass, but just being able to have time to study and just have time to be in your thoughts and have time to be inside this cocoon and hoping that you come out uh, a different person. I think that's what has been the hardest thing is really dealing with the with yourself. I think that's more, um, it's been harder than going outside. Well, I'm honored to have you on the show today in what is obviously a very volatile time in America. Uh, for those that have followed your career and activism closely, they would know that you've been on the front lines of this subject for a very long time. So I, I wanted to start first by asking what went through your mind when you saw the video uh, of the just absolutely tragic George Floyd murder. For me, I think all the videos, when you look at the death of African-American men historically, it's just, it's the lack of humanity. I think when you are looking at somebody who doesn't see the other person's life doesn't have any value and they think that it's their job to end it. And when you look at the George Floyd case, you see a, a man who is constantly trying to reclaim his humanity and his dignity by reminding the officer that he has a mother and that he has a, a wife and that he has kids and he wishes to see them again. I'm not resistant. I just want to survive. I just want to live. I think we're looking at this in this video, we're looking at a group of people in America who just want to live, who just want to be safe, 
who just want to have the opportunity to do what the Constitution said, who have been a part of this country and have been a part of this fabric, even though their existence has been traumatic, they still pay taxes, they still follow the laws, and they just want to exist. And I think when we see somebody's life slowly being drained out of them and we watch it, our heart becomes our heart becomes torn, our our minds become numb because we're seeing so much death so often. But watching another black man die it becomes so normalized in America. It's like we're watching reality TV, but the reality TV isn't scripted. But it's almost like it's scripted because the show always ends exactly the same. It ends in the death. Yeah, and, and being raised in Texas, which is extremely segregated between the rich and the poor, especially in Dallas, I know, and uh, you can have wildly different experiences from one side of the state to the other. Did, did you and your family run into a lot of racism and white supremacy growing up? Racism and... White supremacy is, is pretty, I feel like it's noted in Texas and it's woven into the history if you think about Juneteenth. And if you think about you, you driving, because I'm originally from Louisiana, and having to drive through certain parts of Texas and hoping that you don't run out of gas because you know that there's a reality that there's you're going to have to deal with something, maybe the KKK, maybe who knows where you're going to have to deal with if you stop in a vitor. And I always thought, even with the James Bird situation in Jasper, there always was a sense of um, danger. Always felt like there was a danger to life when it was with police because growing up in, in the neighborhoods I grew up, when we thought about the police, we didn't think about the story, historical, you know, things that are on cartoons, like to help you take the cat out the tree and mm-hmm. doing all this kind of stuff. We always felt like it was like the opposite. It was like they were vilified because and people were horrified of them because of the history of black people being policed. When I thought growing up, we are, I always felt that heat of that on my back. It was like this crawling spider up my spine of, of constant fear of when am I going to be bitten? Yeah, I, that totally. It's something that I think a lot of us, when I say us, I mean white people are starting to sort of try to understand. I don't think we ever will fully understand it, but to hear those words over and over this week has been very powerful. And and we fast forward to 2017 when you had your own experience with police brutality and racial profiling in Vegas, uh, where cops used excessive force on you and, and threatened to blow your head off. And though you had nothing to do with what they were looking for, and yet it seemed like it was pulling teeth to get them to answer for their actions. I mean, even when I did research going into this interview, I, I can't really get them apologizing. I can't find anything. They, they seem to have immediately went on the defensive. What did you learn from that experience? Uh, you uh, facing it firsthand. I had a knee in my back. I felt the feeling of can't breathe, and I felt wanted to exist, not to be deleted from the universe. I felt all that. I felt the heat. I felt the history, what it what it was, the threat of death, the threat of losing my life. And and what I learned from that was that as a black man, we really don't have that. I didn't have value in my life the way that every other American felt. And I felt that the police, at the end of the day, they were going to protect their own. They wasn't going to protect the citizen who had been wronged. And and in that, and I felt like at that line, it was a, it was a line drawn between protecting the, their own and actually protecting the citizens' rights to exist. If you make a mistake and you thought somebody was the wrong person, you should probably just, hey, I thought you were the wrong person. Everybody was running. Hey, I'm sorry, but that never happened. So it was like I was. I was just a pawn. I wasn't. Didn't, I wasn't a human. I was a thing that didn't didn't have a voice. And I think the only reason people paid attention was because I was an athlete and because I was a high profile person. And if anything goes, it would have just been swept under the rug. Yeah, and 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 now we see the protests and riots in cities and other countries. But when you see this on television, there's there's clearly a narrative going on between the word thugs versus the oppressed. What do you see when you look at it at a larger scale of what's happening around the world? I think we're looking at uh, the power. We're looking at suffering, and we're looking at that. What comes with power is the sacrifice of justice. We're looking at people who are in power, and they have done so much to become into power that they have created so much injustice for those at the bottom. And we're looking at people who are screaming and trying to reclaim their humanity and their dignity to have a voice. We're looking at a, a war on poverty in the in the world. We're looking at... One man having $1 trillion. 
We're looking at people wanting water, fair water. We're looking at people wanting fair treatment. This is beyond just the death of George Floyd. The death of George Floyd is the fire that ignited the world's pain and the world's engine to want to have equality in every single facet of the world. And I think we're looking at anger. We're looking at love. We're looking at passion. We're looking at trauma. We're looking at all types of things. We're looking at a, a system that was supposed to be protecting and the government who's supposed to be governing these people and reflecting the issues of his people, it has not been recognized. And now we're looking at the traumatic experiences of everybody else being put out into the streets. And people don't know how to react. The people don't know what to do because they've been asking and being patient and being peaceful. And now people are at the point where fighting is their first option, you know, their first, their second option now. They're fighting is this thing, this fight to survive. If I don't fight, how am I going to survive? And now we have to get a president who doesn't know, who doesn't have the common sense to connect what's happening into the world and what's happening to his people. He has the control of these people. He's had the control of America and has done nothing but perpetuate more hate and more division between the citizens and he's made more barriers between the color of people's skin, between the wealth gap in America and now everything is happening at one time. And I believe that the COVID-19 really showed what America has been really focused on and it's the economy. Right. When you have a hundred thousand people who have death and you have somebody who is numb to one death, then we have an issue because you're saying that people die every single day. And you're not recognizing the numbness and the pain that each person feels when they lose somebody. So we're dealing with a lot of things. And I think that the thing, the most important thing that we're dealing with, we're dealing with a spiritually bankrupt system at this moment. More with Michael Bennett after this. Right now, Feeding America is working tirelessly to ensure our most vulnerable populations, like students who are out of school, the elderly, individuals whose jobs are impacted, and low-income families continue to have access to food and other needed resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Feeding America Food Bank Network is committed to serving communities and people facing hunger in America, and their greatest need is donations and support of local food banks. This podcast is committed to donating a portion of the proceeds from the show to Feeding America, and we hope that you can join us in this effort too. Find out how you can help at feedingamerica.org backslash COVID-19. Now, here's the rest of my chat with NFL lineman and co-host of the podcast Mouthpiece, Michael Bennett. You've been vocal about your support of Black Lives Matter over the past few years, even when it wasn't the cool thing to do. And, and this week, more than ever, there is so much going on about them and around them, smear campaigns and assumptions of what they are and disinformation on the internet. What is it that drew you to that organization specifically? What drew me was the idea that Black Lives Matter. I grew up in the idea that when I watch TV, when I look at the world, that black lives don't matter. And I hear somebody saying that I matter. And I think people are offended by the concept of somebody saying that a particular people matter. See what happens with privilege is that as soon as somebody says that they have privilege, that makes another person want to acknowledge that your privilege isn't over my privilege. But the privilege to live is the privilege of every single human being. And I think that that shouldn't affect anybody else's thought process for saying that Black lives matter, that women lives matter. They do. At this point, we're dealing with the issue that our Black brethren around the world, lives have been lost on the daily, and we watch it every single day. And so that was what drew, drew me to the situation. But it also drew me is that this is an opportunity for us as people to use our platform to talk about the humanity of another person and the humanity of what connects each person, the interconnection between us at the end of the day, everybody's blood is red. And the most important commodity on the planet is the human being. As much as we don't want to agree that we want to talk about black culture and love black culture, but the commodity of the black man or the black woman, the black child, the black school, the black existence, is important because they're human beings. And I think we're overlooking the fact that human beings exist. And I think because if you look at the historical context, an uh, African-American person was never a full human being. They never had the right to a full human being. We had to go to court. We had to go to court, literally had to go to court and get a judgment 
by the Supreme Court to say that we are full human beings. And that is amazing, but that's the history of the country. And I think a lot of white people have failed to forgive, have forgotten the story of the other people around us. And I think Black Lives Matter reminds us that there is a story. There is a story belong before Martin Luther King. There's a story of slavery. And what has that done to our society? We're looking at the grandchildren of those slaves. We're looking at the grandchildren of pain. We're looking at the grandchildren of so many things that have happened to their forefathers that this is the only way that they feel is to bring the light into the history of what has happened and the traumatic situations of being African-American in America. And you've participated in peaceful protests in the past, taking a knee during the anthem or stay, staying seated or waiting in the locker room, uh, kind of following early leads from from Colin Kaepernick. You were endlessly criticized for doing that. And now we see non-peaceful protests in the streets, and now that is problematic as well. Does this give Black people a mixed message? What, how can you actually protest? The problem is that we're protesting a system, and whatever we protest and how we do it is constantly going to affect the people who think they know right. But the people who think they know right, they never do right. They think there's this way to protest, there's this way. What is the what is the way to protest when you want to live? When you want to live and you're drowning, you're fighting to survive out that water. When you're running, when you're in a war, somebody's shooting, you're running as fast as you can, you're trying to survive. What is the right way to survive? I don't know what the right way to survive is. All I know is there's many people trying to survive And there isn't a goddess. But the people who have all the answers on how to protest aren't the people telling us how to survive. They aren't making the rules where people feel like they can survive. They're only sitting in the room and saying, well, this isn't the way I would do it. This is how I wouldn't do it. But at the end of the day, it is about surviving and living and creating a future for their kids and our kids. And like I said, peaceful protests, whatever type of protest, but at some point, Their voice has got to be heard. It's on the government of the United States to stand up and speak for its people. But if those people don't have values, then what's the question? If ever white men were going, white men were getting drugged out their car, shot in the head, and pulled out and didn't have the rules, guess what would happen? Do you know? Boston Tea Party would happen. The American Revolution would happen. These are the things that have happened to white people, and they fought for their independence with the, against the monarchy of the British. They wanted to be free. They wanted to create a new country. The idea of America, the idea, the ideology of what America is supposed to be, it sounds so great. It sounds so dignified. But the actuality, the people within that system that are supposed to be upholding that idea have been spiritually bankrupt and morally corrupt that they can't even see what it means to what people are fighting for the same thing that they were fighting for, but they're only fighting for what was promised to them. Well, you've always been sort of in front of the league before uh, everyone else calling yourself a feminist, aligning yourself with numerous uh, clean food charities, which was something I had never really heard of in the NFL, at least. You've criticized the toxic masculinity in the league. You supported Bernie Sanders' presidential bids twice. What makes you unable to follow when people say to just shut up and play? What 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 is the importance in speaking up for you? I think the importance is, is my children. I think the idea that if I want my children to have a voice and I want them to speak up and I want them to be a certain way, do they need to look on TV to find inspiration? Or is it important for them to find inspiration at home and see that their father and their mother stood up for what was right all the time? And also the ability to have a platform the ability of free will, you know, when you think about in the biblical terms and you think about religion in this point, right? Free will is the thing that the devil fought for and left heaven for. Free will is a burden. And so with our free will, it's one of the greatest things that we have. I and mean, with our free will, if we're choosing to do wrong, then that's shame on us. But the free will to will your neighbor, to will the situation to bring others to the light that are in the darkness, the sickness, the opportunity to people who are sick to bring them to health, the people who don't have food to give them food. That is the reason of being. At the end of the day, I do this because it is the reason for living is to build up our community. It's not just to be in my capitalistic mindset. And I think what's happened in America and what has happened to us, we have become so capitalistic and materialistic that We've forgotten that every time we have a luxury, it creates suffering. And I think it's important that we remember 
And that's the reason why I speak, because people are literally suffering every single day. And I speak on all these issues because there are people suffering who want help and who need it. And people like us, it's a duty and an obligation to stand up on our forefathers' shoulders and continuously build these bridges that other people can see and bring light and continue to bring help to others. I don't know anything else, honestly. And I know you've become friends with John Carlos over the years. Uh, who do you look to as mentors or idols for for this kind of activism and, and speaking up? I think John Carlos for sure. I think historically, I love reading Martin Luther King because I feel like Martin Luther King was such a, a complicated human being. When I think about the intellectual that he was, I think um, I love reading his stuff. Just those are people I just look up to. And John Carlos for sure because he lived it and. Dr. Henry Edwards, Brene Brown, people like that. So it's not also about race. It's also about understanding the mindset of human beings and what do people want in life and how to figure all those things out on top of the social issues, on top of racism, but also just the, the ability to live and the will to live. So there's a lot of people that I follow like that. But at the end of the day, there's so many great people who are great leaders. And whoever listens to this podcast or when you go out, I would, I would just challenge you whoever listens to this, is to challenge yourself is to look in the mirror. I think we live in this situation. I'm sorry to ramble on, but I need to say this. No, please keep going. I think we live in this world and we personify everything that we want people to think of us. And we look, we make Instagram, we make Facebook, we make Twitter so people can see who we want them to see us and who we are. But I want us to really look in the mirror. And I think sometimes looking in the mirror is the hardest thing because when you put on makeup, you put on clothes, you can't see the scars. But when we look in the mirror, we see our emotional scars. We see who we are. And I would challenge us to really look in the mirror and really ask ourselves, what have we really done to change the culture, change the tradition, change the lives of other people? And if we look in the mirror and we don't see that, then we need to really go out and really obtain changing that. It's not just about Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. It's about really getting your hands into the soil and really planting a seed that can grow and a tree that really bears fruit, you know, that bears love, that bears humbleness, that bears faith, that bears loyalty, that does so much more than just about me, me, me. It's really about the whole. And I think we're in this moment where everybody is starting to realize, is looking in the mirror and realizing that it's about the whole. If the arm isn't working, the leg isn't working. If the heart isn't working, then you're dead. It's like the body needs every part of it. And we think about the whole human being, we're all a part of one body. And when one person, when one part of our body hurts, the whole body feels it. And I think if we start thinking like this, we will unite us to really see that it's really the system that we need to be adjusting. And it just goes so far. Everything you're saying, I mean, it really shows, I mean, you, I, I know you've been on this way for a long time and everything we're facing this week for years you've been talking about and it's put you in the spotlight and it's negatively affected your wallet in the past. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about this change. Do you think we're going to see any actual change? And I don't mean to make you say glass half empty or glass half full, but should I have optimism now? I think we should have some optimism. I think the limitations on our human mind and our ability to see the future has just been really blurry because there's not a moment in the reality or in our lifetime that we ever can remember harmony. All we know is fighting. All we know is chaos. All we know is taking. So I do think it's time for a light in the future because I think we're starting to get to this point where we're starting to transfer, transfer made into something more than just body that gobbles up a flesh that only harvests and eats. We're starting to look into our spirit and start to fulfill our spirit. So I do think there's a possibility that the, the future is going to be brighter because I think a generation is judged on its kids. And I think the kids in this generation are really the ones who are really wielding the change in America. Just like it was in the 60s, it was the kids, it was the young people, 25 and younger. And now you're seeing people who are 16 and younger on these streets who have been in America. And there aren't just black kids, those are white kids, those are Hispanic kids. And they're the ones who haven't been tainted with all these other ways to oppress other people. They're thinking as, as a whole human race. We think about climate change, and you see that young girl, Greta, standing up there. Mm-hmm. She's talking from a young person's perspective. So this is what we're seeing. I think we're seeing that the young people are upset about the future of this country and what they're being left with. They're being left with 
a presidential candidate, a candidate they live, being left with President 45, being Donald Trump. I mean, if I die and uh, Barack Obama was my last president, oh. I'd be like, okay, I'm good. Yeah. You know? But people are dying with Donald Trump being their last president, dying with a leader who's stirring up hate. They're dying with that kind of stuff in their heart. That can't be a peaceful way to go. No, and and finally, you, you have a new podcast with your wife, Payla. It's called Mouthpiece, and I know you're going to be talking about a lot of this stuff, and I, I just want to know, what do you and your wife tell your daughters about the events this week? I'm telling my daughter, my oldest daughter, really because I'm trying to get her to understand about researching and the importance of researching and the importance of understanding what's happening around you and how you could be used for a negative or positive. So just really talking about having a positive impact and showing them that, look, there's a lot of people upset and how you feel, please tell us. And I think at this moment, we really can't tell our kids. We really are trying to listen to them, trying to say, hey, what are you affected with? And there's been so many things, conversations burned up that have been amazing because you never know how young kids are thinking. So I would advise everybody to listen to this. I think you guys should ask the kids how they feel. I know we want to tell them how to feel, but this moment, I actually think you should listen to them and ask them how they feel. Well, I, I greatly appreciate you talking to me today. And, and I know a lot of people uh, around the sports world and world in general, including myself, have looked to you for a lot of these kind of answers and, and at least your insight. And I know people would appreciate it. So I, I thank you for giving me the time. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate you. The No Sports Report is produced and distributed by Treefort Media. The show is executive produced by Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, Matthew Kugler, and me, Jensen Karp. Tom Monahan is our senior audio engineer and sound supervisor, with production and editing by Jasper Leak. Additional production help from Tim Schauer, June Rosen, and Haley Mandelberg. Our theme music is composed by Spilkus. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe, rate us, and review us on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please visit feedingamerica.org. If you're able to make a donation, any amount makes a difference, and you can learn more about other ways you can help on their website. For more information on the No Sports Report, links to the socials, and for show transcripts for our hearing impaired listeners, go to treefort.fm. Be safe and be well. The No Sports Report is a production of iHeartRadio and Treefort Media. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.